I make photographs to really challenge what has been put out there of us. And this is another very important part of photography. Like with Sean's work, what you saw also too is how he's challenging you to think. He's challenging us to think differently. So over here you have this gentleman, his name is Supernova Slum. All right. He is black and also too part Navajo Indian. Those feathers in his hair are representing his Indian heritage. Uh, the beads were actually red and blue. And the beads were red and blue representing unity between the Bloods and Crips gang. Um, the tattoos on his back, you can't really see them because I guess the projection over here is a little bit dark. But they are tattoos of all the Egyptian ancestors. So he was pretty much honoring the, the Egyptian ancestors on his back. So this was this one day, 2006. So I saw the sign, I see black people, and I was waiting for actually almost two hours, waiting for the perfect individual to come by when I could compose this picture. Supernova Slam just came out the gym. He was feeling himself, was showing off, told him what I was doing. We had knew of each other before. That's the photograph. So television network, that's a black owned network and that was pretty much promoting black TV and black television programming. And it was catering really to the black audience. They put this advertisement out called I See Black People, pretty much trying to raise attention so that people will know that, okay, this is a black owned television network showing, you know, with programs of black people. And I just figured when I saw the sign, with this being in the black community and also too, it making a statement with this black man also too, who has a whole lot going on, that it would work great with the picture. And it was actually came out of a movie. Exactly. Yeah. So it really was a spinoff of, of I see dead people. Yes. Um, I can't. I think it was a Sixth Sense. I no, think that was. It was one of those. But it was one of those kind of ghost movies. Something. Yeah. Right. But I never saw the movie. Looking at the photograph, everybody, I want you to also think about how I framed the pictures, the composition, what you think my exposure was. Looking at the depth of field all the things we spoke about with you yesterday. So looking at the photograph, what's in the foreground, what's the focus, also to the background, the depth of field, look at all of that. So saying all of this to you is, the more you study pictures, the more you're going to learn how to compose a picture better when you are out in the field. The lens is a 60, which is pretty much a portrait lens. So I shot this. Now this format is a medium format camera. It's a Mamiya RZ. So on that camera, I only have 10 pictures. 10 pictures for one roll. It could be color or next thing is, I didn't say this, all of this work you're about to look at is black and white film. Easter Sunday, Brooklyn, 2011. Oh, I didn't tell you the story on the other young lady. I want to give you a story. Go back on Sean, please. So this young lady's name, her name is Ma'at. She's from Trinidad and Tobago. Um, she's a mother of three. She is also a fitness instructor. And she got her master's degree in psychology two years ago. So another part of Bedford Stuyvesant, so I just want to tell you about is Bedford Stuyvesant was the biggest black community in America, even up until like the early 90s. And Bedford Stuyvesant now, the, uh, it is pretty much, I would say, maybe 50% black or maybe less than that. And it was once just this very multicultural, it's always been a very multicultural um, yeah. neighborhood of <laughs> black people from all around the world and people of color from all around the world, different faiths. Um, and even from people from different parts of America. But now, as we've spoken about before, there's gentrification. So it, what this means is rents are going up, real estate value is going up, and the people who are the pioneers, and the same thing is taking place in Harlem, where Sean is at, 
uh, and how a lot of black people are being forced out because they can't afford to live there anymore. My aunt as well, she was forced out. She lives now in Atlanta, um, but she lived in Bedford-Stuyvesant in Crown Heights, Brooklyn for over 20 years. In America, Easter Sunday is one of the biggest religious holidays in the Christian church. Easter Sunday and Palm Sunday are probably the two biggest ones. Um, in terms of fashion, Easter Sunday and Mother's Day are the two most fashionable days in the black church. So in part of the culture, the hats. Um, and this is a tradition that goes back way back <laughs> to the early 1900s that uh, our people have just pretty much took great pride in. So these two women, uh, they are actually from South Carolina. This is at the AME Mount Zion Church over by Decatur Street. Took this image in 2011 and it just came out. Asked if I could you know, take their photograph and it just being patient. This was the image that I liked. And the, the women were waiting for their transportation called Accessoride, which uh, is a senior citizen's transportation, as well as for people who are disabled. So in this photograph here, and I'm not sure if you noticed the difference in some of the, the last photograph. One, this one's square, the other one was more rectangular, was more traditional. I particularly love the square format. I love the square format. Um, again, it's about your vision, your sense of space. And but for all of you, the work that you're doing, you work with the tools that you have. Um, even though you have less pictures to take on a roll of film, your quality of your negative, of your image is superior. <laughs> Uh, so this image quality, because it has a, it's a bigger negative, it's a finer grain, you could blow this photograph up 20 feet, 10 feet, scan it, it'll look beautiful. It's four times larger than a 35 millimeter negative. Right, so, and in, in putting that in context to what you're doing digitally, um, you shooting on raw, and we'll get into this, you know, a little bit later on, on how you should be shooting your images. Um, a raw file is the highest quality file you should have, and it's the setting you should have your camera on all the time. This is a Santa Dia church. Took this image, I think, in 2006. So that's a grandmother, daughter, and grandchild, right before they're about to go into church. Um, Again, and now as you're looking at it, now what you're seeing is portraits, but you also see, you see a moment that is captured. It's not posed. The other photograph was not posed. You know, the church ladies, they knew I was there, but in your, in your process, when you make your presence felt, you start to get, you know, interact with people, you want people to become comfortable. You want people to know that, okay, as well, your intent is something very honest, and it has something very meaningful. So what we have over here is uh, for me, it's just knowing space. You have to know how to evaluate space, like how I saw the women actually outside of the church. And the thing is this, once you start shooting with in the square format, you start to see and evaluate space a little bit differently. So I knew based on the spacing, whether I need to take a little step further back or get a little bit closer to actually really get what was most important in the photograph. So in terms of maybe having a more traditional format, you could probably get, you, this would have been a completely different picture because the next thing was this, what was to the left and to the right were two closed, um, businesses. So I immediately evaluated what was most important, what was central to the image. And what was central were 
the, was the family. Also, too, I saw the door was open and the people inside. So it gave a sense of place, which was very important. But also, too, it's just you start to train your eye differently. So with this kind of lens, it is very engaging. You have to pretty much be close. And that's what I want to have. I want people to know who I am. I want to introduce myself to people, as well as I want to get to know them with the camera. So you want to say something, Sean? Yeah. One of the things about this camera is it slows you down. down. Right. Got to understand that. It slows you down. And not in a bad way. It gives you a time to think and compose. It's not like 35 millimeter where you can grab a shot and hope that everything is there. This, when you do it, this is what you wanted people to see, right? And it's, like he said, a square format is totally different from the rectangular ones we all are used to dealing with. So over here, Brother Alzo Slade was on his way to church. And um, again, just pretty much trying to show dignity, show our community, some diversity of it. So a lot of what has been documented and shown in bed which you've heard maybe through rap music or even through Chris Rock show, some movies, it has it is shown maybe one perspective, not always, I think, the diversity of our community. And the same thing which could be said about, I think, Ethiopia and about a lot of Africa and about a lot of our communities where we come from, again, is what is covered as and piggybacking what Radcliffe said. Okay, a lot of black people, we know our own stories, but is this story mainstream? You know what, are the stories of triumph, are those making the front page? Okay, um, so I saw a gentleman over here, Alzo, introduced myself to him, I already knew him, told him what I was doing, he was on his way to church, asked if I could take a picture of him, there it is. Alzo is originally from Houston, Texas. And again, evaluating the space. So to let you know, I had both of my cameras with me. I had my square format with me, and I had my uh, Mamiya with me. But based on the space, the background, I knew that a more traditional photograph would be more appropriate. For me, what I saw over here, when I saw Alzo, I looked at, again, evaluating each individual, his dark skin, dark skin man, the coat he had on, okay? And even placing him, like where he is in the frame, his height, I actually went down a little bit lower. I bent down. He stood a little bit taller than me. And I also too, thinking about the depth, the buildings. I also, I pretty much wanted to angle it off, and I wanted to pull you into him. And I also, too, his body language. His body language, how he's standing proud, that was very important to me. So in the construction of the frame, not even thinking about the rules of thirds, I thought about how am I best going to honor this individual? How am I best going to honor this man? And that is what, you know, what stood out to me. So when you are making your images, people, you are studying really the people who you're looking at. You're studying the individuals and you're looking at, okay, what is their best feature? What stands out, you know what, as I look at this person? What is it that makes me want to photograph this person? What is it I want the world to know? What is it I want to know? What is it bringing me a little bit closer? There, we're going to talk, we've talked to you about rules, but one of the things you learn in any art form, they are rules that are set, but once you know the rules, you can break them. I was naive. I was breaking the rules and had no clue. Somehow or another, and you got to remember, my body said that this is the position that this person should be in. Right? I have a problem with the rule of thirds. I really do. I won't go into it, but I don't like sitting somebody off center even though that's the way it's supposed to be done, right? With a, a two and a quarter camera, you gotta remember, you got less space going right. this way. 
So your composition is different and your image is going to, if you photograph a person, it's going to be a larger impact in the print, right? So the 35 millimeter gives you more information, but it doesn't give you as much detail. It doesn't give you much sharpness. It doesn't give you as much quality. The background and the depth over here, I wanted you to completely focus on him as well as to I felt that your eyes were going to go to him first and then it'll just trail off. So by his body language, also to me knowing that what was in the background wasn't as important as him. The background wasn't the main focal point. The background was important to show you a sense of place, architecture, structure, where he is, but the focus was really to be all on him. That's why I composed it the way I did and why the background and the depth of field is the way it is. You have so much detail in the background is because he didn't use a true portrait lens. He used a 35, he used a 60, which is a 35 millimeter. So even if he's wide open, it still allows right. for depth. If he was using an 85, nothing would be in the back. If he was using a 105, a 200, nothing would be in the back. So it's important that all of you Google why you use 35 millimeter, why you use 50 millimeter, why you use a 200 millimeter. It will say things like a 200 millimeter compresses foreground and background. And if you use it well, the background will be gone which is why fashion photographers use 200 millimeters. If you have a 35 millimeter lens, a 50, a 70, okay, a more primed fixed lens, you, it gets a lot more light. As opposed to the longer lens, it takes a lot longer, it's a lot more longer of a process. So the quality, so blowing up a picture, you're not gonna have the same image size quality in most cases, because of this longer lens. So this is also another important reason why we're telling you, you know, with the zoom, because the thing is this, you may take a good picture, but then depending on the camera you may have or the lens, and next thing is different lenses have different quality. This is a Sean Flowers, that's really her name. And uh, she's from Belize, um, actually is an educator. Um, saw her coming out of her apartment, was just waiting for a taxi, um, asked her if I could take, you know, told her what I was doing. So again, I introduced myself, you know, told her who I was, showed her a little bit of my work briefly, gave her my card. So these are some important things I'm saying to you in doing some of your work. It's Great if you could have a business card because people's just going to see that you're professional and also to know that they can get in contact with you. Something just classy, uh, of course, um, but with your email on it, I, I would say mainly your email um, and so people can get in contact with you when you send them a picture. Um, Sean also, too, was one of the people who wasn't able to stay in Bedford-Stuyvesant. She got pushed out and she had to move to Maryland. All right, so this is Nasa Nemo um, Diodi. He is from Dominica. He is, uh, he's a jeweler. He also too is a crochet designer and a fashion designer. He's a husband and father and um, just an artistic guy. And again, looking at, thinking about all the components that we spoke about with, with our photos, with depth of field, out of focus background, you know what? All of this um, in your composition, looking at how I composed the photograph, your exposure, how, what I wanted you to focus on. So take a look at all of these, these elements. Thank you. Sharice Blackman, she is a singer. This was just, saw her at a, it was at an event. It was a, a, an event for ladies. It was a tea sipping event. Um, she's a backup singer for Jill Scott, vocalist from Philadelphia. 
and just was a moment of her right before she left. I mean, are people seeing the power and impact of a portrait? I mean, I'm moved by these. All right, so portraitures and documentary are journalism. One of the things I wanted to say, that every commercial sign you see, there's a portrait of a woman, most times. So commercial businesses understand the value of a portrait. Every, so, ma every magazine, Vogue, uh, yeah, all so of the magazines. Yeah, so you guys gotta understand, there's all kinds of approaches to this thing. Right. Right, and like Russell said, you might not have seen many of mine, but I shoot a lot of portraits too. I just don't approach me. But I do know the power of a portrait. Cleveland Sampson. Uh, Cleveland is a carpenter and an actor. He's from Guyana. Uh, took this, this is just him waiting for the train on a random day in, in Brooklyn. And uh, this is also too, so when I'm, as you can see here with the work, is bed has this reputation of it being a slum. Dirty place, dangerous place, some place you don't want to be seen. That has been the image that has been pushed throughout the world. So I knew what I saw every day. Um, the community has its challenges, like every community, but the gold, the heart, the soul of the community is just what you're seeing now. Do you, and I need to say that, do you see that all of us work out of a, a love for our community and, and the importance of showing the positiveness of our community? That's right. All right, so that's all, what motivates all of us. Nigga Beach. You understand? Know because if you look at that series of photographs, you couldn't tell what class these people come from. Right? But if the Dwight Press will make it, if you don't see it, we're going to write it. Right? That this is, these people come from a poor environment and this, that, and the other. So we try to show the flip side of that because we love these people and we love our community. Right. And we love our people. Period. And this is the importance of why we want all of you, we want to empower every single one of you in here to be the authors of your story. It's because some people who have been well-intentioned, very well-intentioned, but they aren't from our community, they haven't had our same experiences, they don't know what it is, and then even too, you know what, they've had their own biases or perceptions, and this is what it's all about, the perception as opposed to the reality. So, Ruddy said yesterday about how, or the day before, how he doesn't photograph for black people. He <coughs> photographs, you know, for white people because he wants to educate them. And I want to make sure we make that clear. That is to educate them, but also, too, that's just really about in America where we are. The work is also, too, to educate us all. Because a lot of you don't know really about maybe where we come from. <coughs> So this is what we are here to do. We're here to share. And just how you are sharing your lives with us, your home with us, we're here to do the same. That's what this whole month-long workshop is about. Changing perceptions. This is Josh, Joshua Alafia and Yaya DaCosta, their, their wedding day. This was about three years ago, two, three years ago. So again, this is an image you don't always see, uh, really, of us in love. Um, you hear about the broken family all the time single, in Black America. Single moms. single moms, irresponsible black men. I mean, that image is saturated. I mean, about black men in America, all are violent. I mean, I can't even tell you how many people even said to me on some of my prior visits, Russell, you're from Brooklyn, you a gangster? <laughs> and here's, 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 here's something also, you know, Again, as journalists, you, we have to, we're, it's incumbent upon us to go deeper. So you hear that the perception of black men is that they do not take care of their families. On the flip side of that is a, a social system, a welfare system that offers money to a single mom right. if she is not with a man. 
Mm. Exactly. Big problem. And that perpetuates black men not being in the home. But nobody talks about that. Yes. The one thing that they say is the men are not at home. However, if the man is at home, the, the society, the social services do not help the family. This is Ivory. Um, Ivory was 17. This is her holding her goddaughter. This is our Franklin Avenue. Took this image in 2007. Um, her goddaughter was just a little restless in the sun. Ivory just held her close, took her out the sun into the shade. Now, do you see the universality? This is woman and child. Now, if that's not universal, I don't know what is. This is not bound by a community. Okay? So, I don't want you to, to feel as though, well, this doesn't translate to this country. This is Ronnie. Uh, Ronnie is a retired Marine, um, as well as she's an accountant, as well as a jewelry designer. And I photographed Ronnie, I took this image, I think in 2013. And I photographed Ronnie in 2009. And I photographed her in 2009 um, in my studio. She said that I really made her feel beautiful, that she had felt, you know, in a certain way about being photographed, but I made her feel beautiful. You know what, she's dark skinned and there's been this big colorism, you know what, a crisis also too in America about being dark, about having, you know what, very like African features and how we've had this poison mind state of being, you know what, lighter skin, straight in, straight in hair is what really beauty is and being slim is what beauty is. So Ronnie, um, I thought was exceptionally beautiful. And for me and my work is I really want to give the people who aren't given the platforms really the space to really show who they are and how beautiful they are. So I particularly want to give everybody who I think mainstream media does not identify as beautiful and show them how beautiful they are. And this time she had got, she was pregnant, expecting her second child. And she said she wanted me to take a nude. So she hired me to actually take this photograph of her in her place. And again, Ronnie is a casualty of gentrification. She couldn't afford to stay in Bedford Stuyvesant anymore. And she moved, she lives now in Florida. Sometimes with your work is you want to challenge people to think differently. This is the whole point of some of the work which I'm doing, is when I told people where I lived um, who weren't necessarily from Bed-Stuy or Brooklyn, everyone said, you must walk around with a bulletproof vest and a helmet. And I was offended. Uh, this isn't all of Bed-Stuy. This isn't just what the community is. I knew what I saw every day. And with that, I said, okay, the best way I can actually change this stereotype, change this perception, it's through the pictures. So walking around every day with my camera, I just introduce myself to people. Some moments I captured, like this photograph over here. This is of Supreme and Tyshawn. Supreme is the, is the gentleman on the left. Tyshawn is his stepson. And um, they lived on, this was image was taken in 2000, five and uh was talking with supreme one day he always used to see me with my camera just asking some questions told him what i was doing i was documenting the community i was looking to make a book and as we were talking he was just telling me he was going to be him and his stepson were going to be going out someplace and i just asked him if i can come and you know what made me photograph their time and when i when i said that to him he said sure and it turns out it was the first time he was showing Tayshawn how to tie a tie. And this over here is such like an important part of father to son, big brother, little brother, just also to men bonding. That is an important part of life. But this picture also has special meaning to me because Supreme is not Tayshawn's father. He's not Tayshawn's father but he's fallen in love with his mother and he is playing, you know what, his, he is his father. He has stepped into that role. 
And what Supreme said to me is, he said, Russell, I love being a stepdad. He said, stepdad means I'm stepping up to be a dad. Mm -hmm. Okay, this is G Lo. Took this image in 2007 or 2008. Saw G Lo walking down the street. Um, this is on Jefferson Avenue. She was with his family. He had three kids. So his daughter was in the stroller. And she just, you know what, started having a little tantrum. And he just picked her up. And I particularly love this image because of who G Lo is. The way he's dressed, he is, you know, with the hip hop community. He's the baggy jeans, he's the stereotype. He has been, you know what, arrested, stopped, I mean, for just nonsense, just being a black man. And here he is, he's just a proud father, working, trying to take care of his family. So this is the masculine man, you know what, the identity that is seen as the thug, that is seen, you know what, as intimidating. But what do you see over here? This is what you don't see, and this is what we see every day. Michael Young, one of my favorite photographs, took this image in 2011 on Lexington Avenue, close to Nostrand. Uh, saw Michael with his father and sister on him walking to church and saw them from behind. Didn't even see their faces, but I ran, you know what, to catch up to them, introduced myself to the father, and I want you to see what I'm doing over here. So you see, Parent with children, definitely introduce yourself to the parent. You see a couple, always introduce yourself to the person of the same sex. You don't want it to be interpreted as you're flirting with this person's partner, okay? Very, very important. If you have shades on, take them off. You want people to look into your eyes. You want to make contact, you want to connect. So I spoke to his father, let him know I was a photographer that was documenting the community and I was looking to do a book and I asked him if I could take a picture. He told me I had just five minutes. They were on their way to Sunday school. And what stood out to me when I saw this young man was how much he was really trying to be like his father. He, that was his father's hat. I asked him, he said, that's his father's brim. And then the next thing is, here it is. This is also too a part of black youth that you don't see, which is just almost a rites of passage for a lot of people. And you go to church every Sunday you know what, you're going to get closer to God, and whether you like it or not, you're going. <laughs> if you're sick, you're going. You're gonna get better when you're in church. You know, you have to go. And this is an image you don't see. So the, uh, he's holding his Bible. It says, trust the Lord. And another thing which just stood out was also to the suit he had on. So seeing that suit, um, you may not be able to tell maybe from where you're sitting, but the suit, is way too big for him. But this is something I think maybe a lot of men could identify with, is there was a time when, you know what, you, your mom bought you a suit and she knew you was gonna be growing and, you, and you know what, we couldn't afford to buy a suit every year. And like, boy, you gonna grow into that suit and that shirt. <laughs> Guys, you, can y'all, true? Yeah. <laughs> All right. Yeah. Tiffany is her name. Your lady was a sweet 16 came to uh, my studio and uh, she was actually wanting to get some portraits done and she was waiting for her date and he was late and she was a bit nervous and there goes the moment. So again, a portrait capturing a moment and this is what I'm saying to you about always being prepared, being alert, having your camera settings, right? Because here it was, we were supposed to, we were gonna take studio pictures. I had the background set up, but while she was there waiting, I had already, you know, did my metering, even while she was there waiting, always being alert and ready to make an image. This is Angel and his girlfriend. Um, can't remember her name. So they were about, I think, uh, 18, 19. They were actually having an uh, argument over texting. So she said, I text you and you don't, she said, you text me, but when I call you, you don't answer the phone. So <laughs> they were having a back and forth about this. And I just approached them and asked them if I could take their photograph. And here it is. And what you're seeing again is just the fashion of, of New York City, inner city. He has on a do-rag, a lot of guys wear that. You know what, they try to get waves in their hair to make their hair look a little bit pretty. 
Uh, and then he has this tattoo on his neck which says R.I.P. Grandma? I think it was Grandpa. Grandpa. But the tension is in the picture. Exactly. It, it, the, the, the moment is still there, which is something that as photographers, as writers, I mean, I, I mean I, my first, when I graduated from college, it was, it was to be a writer. Um, these, are, these are the things that you have to put into your work. It's actually, it's more important that you create what, what was there, more so than try to fabricate what you think should be there. And no matter, I mean, the whole idea is Russell went up to a couple to photograph what he thought was a beautiful image. And yet, in that image is the tension of the story before he got there. And that's our aim as, as documentary and historian, photographer, screenwriters, Educators, filmmakers, sure. whatever you, you choose to do, your first job is to document the moment that is there. They actually lean back. They actually ask me, you know, what, how did I want, how, how did I want them to stand? Because another thing I want to say over here is, I could have taken, taken a picture of them when they were having the argument. I could have. But now, what would that image look like? You have two young black people, and what also too is the perception of us. And you have to think about this with your work people. This is so important. It's thinking about, okay, if I take a photograph of two people arguing, you know what, what would be the perception? And actually, what is really the story behind it? What are they arguing about? This is a Black, uh, that's his nickname. Black, also known as Dollar. So I met Black 2000. Four, I met him, and I met him, Chinese restaurant, he walked in, prepared with my camera, and I knew immediately that he was into street life. But even me knowing that, so this is another important element, what I'm trying to look for you, is you always are going to move smartly, but also too, there's a part of you which has to be fearless when you're doing this work. Because the stories you're gonna tell, they take courage. They take courage, and you also have to think about what is, why did you choose this work? And never forget that. Never forget your mission. You know what, in honoring people. And you know what, in trying to change the narratives, in educating. So as I saw Black, you know what, I approached him, told him what I was going to do. What I, I was a photographer, documented neighborhood. Asked him if I could photograph him. He said, no problem. And I even invited him to my studio. And I said to him, you know what, uh, I'll do a portfolio for you for free. All you gotta do is come to my place. Lived literally around the corner from where he lived. He came twice, and when he came to me, um, he told me about how he wished he had met me years ago. He was 19, and he said, you know, Russell, he said, Big Russ, I wish I met you years ago. He said, I'm 19, I have five Fs, so that's street language for felonies. So when he was young, when he was around 13, he had gotten robbed, beat up, because depending on where you may live um, in New York City, the gang life, how it works is if you aren't strong, if you don't have, you're not well known, you don't have you know, a lot of brothers, you're not an athlete, is you know what, you may be targeted, you know, to maybe get robbed or jumped you know, for initiation. So some young men, they join gangs really for safety and protection. So he said to me, I was 13 and I got in robbed. I just bought some sneakers and my sneakers got taken off my feet. This happens. Just bought some sneakers. Some people jumped them, pulled out a gun, took sneakers off his feet and he felt he had to start carrying a weapon to protect himself. And when I took this photograph, this was actually in 2007. He had went to jail. He never came back to my studio because he just did not have the confidence. He didn't think that he could make it. And I tried to keep him encouraged. But again, about 
the streets, not enough support. And when I took this image, he had just found out uh, someone that he knew she just got killed. And since 2007, he's been locked up. This is what I'm saying to you, you all about how with time, you are going to your attention to detail. Sure, yeah. Your attention to detail is going to become Sec superior. Second nature. Second nature and superior to anybody. So it's the subtle things like how did I see where he was standing? Yes. And again, I said this before, we've all spoken about this before, about positioning. So I saw where Black was standing and you know what? It was the moment. This wasn't the only picture I took, but I saw where he was standing. I positioned myself and you know what? His friends were in the background. Again, they were important, very important. But also too with this photograph is you also have a sense too when you look at this picture that he is a leader, right. like he is the man. Right. He is the man. And that's exactly what it is. He is the man that you know what people look up to. He's a young man that people respect and they look up to, even fear. So his reputation and that too is all what I was seeing, you know what, once I was over there constructing the image. So her walking down the street, T-shirt, um, see what it says? Exactly. So she was, I think, 18, 18, 17 at the time, and that's her niece. So I saw her with the T-shirt on. I ran from behind her. You know what? To just tell her who I was, ask if I could take a picture. And when I, she said, sure, took this photograph. And what I do all the time, I always give people my card. And I always offer people a copy of the photograph for free. So I tell people I can email them or I can send them a print if they're okay. But I want them to have a copy of the image. And I also asked them if it's okay if I could use their image, you know what, to publish for my book, also to educate. And I will tell you this, 95% of the people always say yes. Now, when I sent Nunu a copy of the image, she was supremely embarrassed and ashamed. She said she never realized, she said she just thought the shirt was cute. And she felt like she was the worst, you know, what aunt could be, that how she was with her niece and she did not send a good example, you know what, to her niece. So this is how your pictures also too can even change the way people see themselves. And another thing about this image, look, looking at it, bed this area where this is at, it doesn't even look like that anymore. Those stores are gone. And that man who's in the back, those two men, they were gawking. They were all trying, you know what, to you know, proposition her. Really, what you want to say? Um, just, the, I, just the idea that the, the word toys mm. is in the background. Um, no, no, should still be playing with toys. To me, she's a. I mean, she's a young adult, yes, but she's still a kid. To me, and so this, the whole picture is framed within the space where. You find that teenagers in, in, in America, and even in Jamaica, have had to grow up too quickly. You know, and so the reason I'm pointing it out is that you see the image that you're making, you see around the image as you're making it. That you don't just walk up to an image and shoot it just because, that you look around the background. Today I had a wonderful talk about foreground background. We have not really, gone into all the aspects of photography. Full, full grown background is, is one of the most beautiful ways of texturing your image. Um, this is beautifully textured with the guys gawking on the left and the idea that here is this, <coughs> here is this girl wearing a shirt that's, for me, for me, 10 years her senior. So I, I want you guys to, when you, also when you look at an image, when you look, when you go to online, you don't just look at an image and go, oh, it's a, it's a beautiful image, or I want you to look around the image, critically look at the image. Do you, do you understand what that term means? I might not know enough about you,
to, to say what I'm about to say. But what I've noticed that's lacking is experience with the field of photography or the field of film. Grace Jones, well, 50s? No, 60s. Grace, jo 60s. 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 Grace Jones changed the perception of women Big time. and black women yeah. through her, her strength, the power she had no, as a model and black, as a singer. As a singer she changed the model the way the world looked at a woman in the industry. No, just because she's 67, looking different from what she looked. I mean, you should Google who she was. I mean, you should Google like. She was street She was not. She was not the wiry woman from the Vogue magazine. She was just strong, like an Amazon woman. But back in the days when Amazon men, we're kind of ugly. Wait, and to add one thing, her personality, her mouth, when she speak, it's like she, she is was not a reserved woman at all. So to answer you, so to answer you, just because she's 67, that was what I was capturing. I was capturing her entire, what's the word? Her entire her legacy. Her legacy. Not just that one moment. Exactly. I have images. I'm shooting digitally, so you know, my fingers are like... But I still control what that editor gets. And that's what I want to do for the rest of my life. I want to control what I put out there. No longer what an editor should give to them. I want you guys... I'm just saying, I want you guys to have... To know you have that same power. The power of perception, the power of changing how you are written about, how you are photographed. The story that I'm told about you, I want you to go, whoa, 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 whoa. You weren't here. I'll give you another example. Dance hall, my dance in Jamaica, where women are considered to be promiscuous just because they allow for their clothes to be lifted up. Now, if you look at any story in antiquity about um, fertility dance in Africa. There's a lot of sexuality around it. It does not mean the woman is promiscuous. In a ceremony, the fertility dance has nothing to do with promiscuity. It's a ceremony, it's a dance. It, it's the celebration of fertility. A person coming to shoot dance hall has no idea of that history. What they see is a woman who's lifting up her skirt. What they don't know is under the ceremony is an underlying factor, an underlying story where the woman is saying, just because I'm poor, I can still afford Victoria's Secret. Mm -hmm. So she's making, a, she's making a second statement that I'm able, through my work, able to wear the same thing that I see in the magazine. Now a white dude, which is normally who comes on to Jamaica and shoot, does not have that story. So he comes back to Jamaica with these inflammatory stories about Jamaican women are promiscuous. I have the, the obligation to change in that perception. Not to censor, but to change the way mainstream people. We have all been in situations where there was one photo we could take, there's a photo we may take, and then the photo we may show. So, in how a story is conveyed, and you have to really understand this, and particularly have this sensitivity and awareness really about, okay, your people and these ethics of journalism, and how, who created these ethics? As well as, too, did they have the best interests of your people? Do they understand really who we are? Okay, because you think, how a lot of history has been taught. I mean, we, we haven't been also to a lot of the authors of those stories.